This presentation concerns what happens in literacy development during stages three and four. Stage three is titled Learning to Read. Up until now, children have been learning how to read. Now they are accurate and fluent enough to use their reading skills to think about what they're reading and develop reading comprehension. In stage four, reading with multiple perspectives, students learn how to read critically across a wide range of text. So let's take a look at what's happening in stage three. It starts in third and is mostly finished by eighth grade for those who are normally developing readers. In the area of narrative text, they understand a literal comprehension like story, grammar, plot, who did or wanted what, but, and so. They also begin to develop inferential comprehension, which is understanding of what the author's purpose was in writing a piece, something that's very, very important in our current society, and also be able to uh, tell what the theme and mood of a piece is, and the affective response, where they're able to appreciate the language of a writer and relate it to their own life. Expository text takes an even bigger role at this point in children's school schooling. Again, under the area of literal comprehension, they need to understand how to separate the main idea from details, and especially to summarize. Summarization is an extremely difficult process to learn and very important to be taught during this time. Paraphrasing rather than plagiarizing is also an important topic that comes into play at this time. And critical comprehension, beginning to really predict and sequence events to compare two different texts or two different uh, versions um, or two different opinions to draw conclusions and beginning to evaluate the worth of an author's work. Here is an example of a stage three reader. Um, in stage three, prior knowledge will predict comprehension. So this is a little third grader who's been asked, been asked a question. What was Martin Luther King's main goal? To um, change the laws so um, they didn't have to give up seats to all white people. Mm -hmm. Okay. And other things for, for blacks? No. And comprehension involves both literal and inferential levels. In stage four, reading with multiple perspectives, which uh, starts about in eighth grade and goes through our adult lives, uh, students can now respond to narrative and expository text at all levels, literal, interpretive, evaluative, and creative. They can interpret an author's purpose, whether it's to inform, to persuade, to give opinions. They master content area vocabulary. This is especially important for English learners who uh, very often will become conversationally fluent within two to three years of coming to the United States but really, really need a lot of vocabulary development to learn the academic language of school. They will understand figurative language and multiple meanings. Uh, again, this is a challenge for native English speakers, and it's a double or triple challenge for students who come from another country. Many of our idioms just don't make sense, like, he's pulling my leg and those need to be uh, taught in a very deliberate way to English learners and also to some students with disabilities, for example, students with Asperger's, which is now called high-functioning autism. They need to understand text structure, and that understanding text structure is going to help you understand the text itself. So if you know that a history text is written in sequence, or that a science test text is written as a cause-effect 
or problem resolution that's really going to help people uh, classify the information they get and figure out how to understand it. And they need to employ reading strategies. Some of you may remember the old SQ3R uh, survey, question, uh, read, respond, uh, recite. I'm not sure I got that right, but in any case, that was developed by the U.S. Army in the Second World War because they were getting recruits who couldn't read the field manual on how to assemble their rifle and other things, and so they developed this as a way of helping them with comprehension. We have uh, strategies like thieves that are more enjoyable nowadays, but the good old SQ3R does work. Um, they also need to know when to skim and scan because very seldom do we really read word for word for word, especially in expository text. So how do you do that in order to get the important information? Spelling development in stage three is spelling by meaning. Stage one was spelling by sound, where a young child will write S-E-D for said and W-E-Z for was. Stage two is patterns, spelling by pattern, where they, they learn that the sound k can be made by many different individual letters and letter combinations. Stage three moves to the third level of our language, spelling by meaning. And spelling by meaning is also a derivational constancy stage. I'll talk more about that derivational constancy a little bit later. But one of the basic understandings of this stage is that syntax can determine the spelling, not the sound. So for example, the ed ending indicates past tense, hunted, spelled, tipped. So no matter how it sounds, it is spelled with ed. By the way, I see this as one of the most prominent omissions in writings of uh, second language learners, even those who have attained a high level of English proficiency. Actor, better. Um, the R controlled, E R O R, U um, R endings are really difficult because you the sound is the same but the spelling is different depending on what you're talking about. They need to understand that meaning can determine the spelling. So for example, sign, signal, ensign all have the same base word S I G N, which by the way, if you know what an ensign does in the navy, he's the guy or I suppose now a woman who waves the flag. And so they all have that same base of S-I-G-N, meaning some kind of a sign, even though they are pronounced differently. And of course, the perennial one for kids in school, principal, to act upon a principal, or that the principal is your pal. <clears throat> this is the stage where students begin to use their knowledge of prefix suffixes, Latin and Greek roots, in order to unlock a plethora of vocabulary. In fact, this is what creates the explosion of academic language, is teaching them systematically how to deal with Latin and Greek roots, which we're going to go through in just a little while. They also use their knowledge of foreign words to deduce spelling. Rendezvous means around you, or antique, knowing that that k at the end of antique is spelled with a Q-E-E, Q-U-E, because it comes from French. Spelling instruction at stage three is really vocabulary instruction, and this is one of my very favorite uh, cartoon series because of the celebration of words. Um, and I love that you don't realize just how weird their conversations are until you walk into the middle of one. So let's talk about the importance of teaching etymology or the origins of words. First of all, Latin words make up 55% of all of our English words. Latin words are developed in a very systematic way. There's a prefix plus a root plus a connective 
plus a suffix. And you see here predestination as an example of how Latin roots are built, Latin words. Teaching should begin heavily to teach Latin roots and the prefixes and suffixes by fourth grade in order to really keep our students um, conversant with the texts that they need to read in science, social studies, literature, all of the uh, content areas. And that's equally true for English learners. They need access to Latin words as soon as they become conversationally fluent enough to be able to really dive into academic language. Greek words are interesting because although they only make up 10 percent of our English words, they proliferate in content texts, especially in middle school and high school. They are also different from Latin because they do, are composed of two roots connected with a connector. So, for example, psychology um, is an example of two different roots. And teaching of Greek roots and, and word building should begin by sixth grade. We're going to have some fun with both of these in just a little while. So how do you teach Latin word parts? Well, the usual approach is to, here's 20 uh, frequently used prefixes, here's 10 or so suffixes, and here's some roots. Boring. But I would suggest that our students need to discover uh, words and the way that we've done it with our Countdown to College students who are rising ninth through 12th graders is to give a team a root not a list of the prefixes and suffixes, just a root. And they discover, they search for words wherever they can with their iPhones, with spell checkers, online at dictionary.com. And by doing that, they discover prefixes and suffixes, and they begin to really understand how this one root will help to unlock a, just a huge number of words. This is an example of one team. It actually was one of our graduate classes using the root struct. And notice that in one, on one spot, they took the word destruct and they put in all of the prefixes and suffixes they could think of that created word building with struct. And then obstruct, and they did the same thing. Prefixes in one color and suffixes in another. So they have these major words around the web struct. And another important thing that I forgot to mention is you do not tell them what the root means. They discover it in the process of discovering all those words. So they would dis dis discover that struct means build. So now let's talk about Greek derived words because that's different. There's a process called walking through words by meaning. And what happens is you record an unknown word and a sentence. In this uh, case, orthography is the unknown word. And the sentence is English orthography is not crazy and it carries the history of the word with it. So then you break apart the word parts. So we have ortho and we have graph as roots. And then you list, have your students list the related words like orthopedic and orthodontist. On the graph side, graphic, phonograph, uh, there's a whole number of them there. Then, then they need to start looking at what the, that means from, based on what they know these words, related words mean. So for example, ortho, students will really come up with fix or straighten or correct. For graph, written or symbol or visual. And what orthographic actually means is correct spelling or the spelling system, the writing system of a language. Then the last step is that they verify the meaning. They can do that at dictionary.com, for example. Um, and if they do, they will find out that one definition is a writing system. Number two is spelling considering to be correct. 
three is the principles underlying spelling, and four is the study of spelling. So orthographic is fix or correct spelling, the spelling system of a language. So here's something that I would like to challenge you with, and uh, we don't have an interactive time to do this online, but uh, the new word is retronym. Black and white TV is a retronym. So if you look at the word parts, you have retro and nem, right? If you list some related words, you would probably have retro means antique, going back. Uh, nem is name. So from that, can you deduce the meaning and verify the meaning? I'll leave you with that puzzle. It's a great, great example of a retronym, black and white TV. I'd like to re review the major concepts of spelling by meaning so that you have a sense of exactly what ones need to be focused on during this stage of literacy development from third through eighth and beyond, actually. So first of all, one of the principles that we talked about is that meaning often takes precedence over sound in spelling a word. So we had insignia, sign, ensign, signal. The meaning of it is there, S-I-N-G, S-I-G-N is in each of those words, but in each of them it's pronounced differently. Syntax often takes precedence over sound in spelling a word, and ED is a perfect example of that, hopped, wanted, danced. Uh, stress determines meaning, so for example, the word C-O-N-T-E-N-T. -E she is very content with her lot in life. The content of the box is a mystery. The next one, he sang the aria with perfect pitch. I need to perfect my speech by tomorrow. Notice how your accent changes the uh, use of the syntax of the, of the, from a verb to an adjective or from a noun to um, adjective. Um, this is a fun exercise for kids to find common words and then play with the accent of the stress in order to determine how that changes. <clears throat> Syntax also determines the meaning. For example, teacher, how do you read this word? I read about the game in the paper yesterday. Without having the uh, context of a sentence, you will not know how to pronounce read versus read. Now what's interesting in spelling is that very often going from a base word to adding suffixes, the uh, vowel changes. It's called vowel alter alternation. So there are some vowels that change from a long vowel sound to a schwa. So preserve becomes preservation. Invite becomes invitation. And very often, if kids don't know how to spell the longer word, that vowel that's the schwa, you can ask them to go back to the base word to break it down back into the simple word, and they will then be able to hear the vowel. Um, sometimes they change from schwa to short, pedant to pedantic when you add another syllable. So those are higher level spelling skills, but also very intriguing ones for kids to discover. And then of course, what we just talked about, word meanings that are derived from parts. And the takeaway message is, uh, if you're teaching English learners or native English speakers, you should be doing this at least by fourth grade or for English learners by the time they reach um, conversational English. Uh, Latin prefixes and suffix fourth and Greek roots by sixth. So let's talk about writing development in stage three. Again, keep in mind we're talking third through eighth grade. The examples I'm going to show you are all from third grade, a third grade writing project 
in Australia, and I think you'll be blown away by the sophistication of some of these. So what do we find? In stage three, we call it differentiated writing. They can now write stories, reports, procedures, explanations. They we can really vary their writing. They can use paragraphs, or they should be able to use paragraphs, headings and expository, and dialogue and narratives. These also, by the way, become goals for you as a writing teacher in this stage. They can use a variety of simple, compound, and complex sentences. They can consider their audience in developing information and use a variety of linking words, varied vocabulary, adjectives, adverbs, similes, and metaphors. You should be able to expect correct punctuation at this stage, and also at this stage, they should be proficient in using the full writing process in planning, drafting, editing and rewriting, and uh, publishing their work. So let's see an example from third grade. This is a narrative writing example. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but this little girl is talking about when my puppies ran away, and what you can see by just looking at it is that she clearly separates it into paragraphs. You can also see that in the, on the second page, she uses uh, punctuation, not always correctly. She said, I asked my mom, so where are the puppies? And she puts her quotation, ending quote, um, quotation mark within the question mark. Um, but in the next sentence, she does use it correctly. So she's on the verge of being able to use punctuation correctly. Um, this is an informational writing piece, and it's an author study, and it's a wonderful example of a little boy who loves Raoul Dahl. Do you like Raoul Dahl, books by Raoul Dahl? I really do, exclamation point. You should read some. He's one of my favorite authors, exclamation point. He wrote at least 19 children's books, if not more. Then he goes on to tell us all about Raoul Dahl's life, including the fact that he was married to Patricia Neal, which is kind of interesting. And he talks about where he got his ideas. And he ends it with, you can still find his books at a bookstore or library and read his stories. Most of his ideas for these stories came from some dreams or stories he told to his children. I want to read all of his books, but I'm not there yet. It's a wonderful, wonderful voice um, in what essentially could be classified as a book report, which many kids see as extremely boring. However, the difference here is that it's an author that he loves, and it's an author's study. It's not just, this book is about blah, 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 blah. This is one of my very favorite ones. It's a fictional writing uh, piece on how to change schools by Tucker. You know, I have changed schools a lot, and I've decided to tell you kids that haven't changed schools before what it's like. Well, it's not easy. You have to change styles of work. You have to learn new rules, and worst of all, you have to leave old friends and make new ones. I have gone to three different schools in four years, so I've gone through this experience plenty of times, and I'm okay about it. The first step is changing styles of work. For example, one school might say you need to have five items for a proper heading on your paper, and your new school says three. You have to be willing to forget the old ways and practice the new ones. The second step is to learn new rules. At one school, if you sign a conduct folder three or more times in a week, you would lose free time on Friday afternoons. At your new school, if you sign a teacher book three times in a day, you would have to call your parents right then. So you might have to practice more self-control. Last of all, you have to make new friends. This is the easiest part of change because a lot of the people are nice. If you are nice to them by sharing and joining in at games, they will want to be your friend. In my opinion, changing schools can be good because you learn how to change what you do and how you do it. But best of all, you end up with more friends than before. So all of you who are teaching the, trying to teach the five-paragraph essay to fifth or sixth graders, wouldn't this be an awesome example? 
and this is written by a third grader. I should tell you that this is from a writing project in Australia where children simply write every day from kindergarten. They have writing, and of course they have many lessons on different aspects, but the main thing is they are writing and writing, and research shows us that clearly kids who write every day are much better writers than those who study grammar for an equivalent amount of time. So here's a literature one. Emma is writing about a turtle. Turtle swims through clear water, clear blue sky, swoops down, blends water. Wheat glides through the water, it sways in the sky, cloud white as winter snow, sun orange as Australia's orange, water clear as lenses, turtle swims. What a beautiful little free verse poem that gives you such an awesome picture of what she sees in her environment. I love this one. Again, it's a book report, but this kid is really excited about the outcast of Redwall, and it comes through in his uh, review. This well-known author has finally made a book that no one can resist or not love. This tale of friendship and love will bring tears to even the youngest readers. This book is a must for every library, private, public, or government. I still remember the section in which Sun Flash returned to Salomonston, a true badger lord. I can still see him walking across the hot sands to Salomonstrom. I remember Veal's six claws difficult decision. Veal's father was evil, so Veal had two parts of evil in him, and these parts led him to murder and to be outcast. But Veal also has good parts. Later, Veal has a difficult decision to make. Should he join the ones who outcast him or join his evil father and his murdering band? I suggest this book to readers young and old. It should be read immediately. Also, Brian Jacques is open for letters, and quite soon he will be opening a fan club, and also he's writing a new book. The Outcasts of Redwall has certainly brought a new dimension to book writing. I rate this book eight stars. Miles, reporter. What a wonderful, wonderful advertisement for this book. I love the visual this, this kid sets up, and he does not tell us the ending. He sets up the suspense so that we absolutely have to read The Outcast of Wedwell. By the way, this series is usually something that's popular among fifth graders. I was really surprised to see a kid as young as third grade uh, reading this, although the content certainly would be very interesting to kids that young. All the mice that are the good guys and the badgers and the rats that are the bad guys. So let's talk about the characteristics of stage four writing. This starts in eighth grade and goes all the way through adults, but certainly we would hope to have them be expert writers by the end of um, high school. I will tell you though that our English professors at my university still find kids who are very deficient in writing. But here's what they should be doing, able to do. They should be able to write a, write a very wide range of form, forms, including essays and persuasive and editorials. They should be able to differentiate their writing by their audience and their purpose, write to define, clarify, develop ideas, and express creativity. They should be able to research and develop a topic fully, write a range of expository text, including cause, effect, sequence, and comparison. Remember that in uh, stage three reading, they were learning how to read these kinds of texts. Now they should be able to produce them. And of course, accurately use a wide range of punctuation, and finally edit and evaluate their own writing, to be able to critically evaluate what's good and what needs improving of their writing. Now, in looking for an example of stage four writing, I did not have access to any high school text writings that would exemplify this, but I did have access to the poem of a 16-year-old girl who had quit school when she was reading only at second grade level, 
and we had just started a new project where uh, we were using a phonetic alphabet, the initial teaching alphabet, to allow students to build up their voice in writing and their reading because they had not cracked the code way back in elementary, and this was how to move them in in, a, in an adult kind of way to writing and reading uh, rather than having them go back and do the fat cat sat on the mat. Um, the poem that she wrote is um, just something that t has totally inspired me for about 25 years. And it's written in this phonetic alphabet, although I think you'll be able to read it. I will read it for you. When the Baby Cries. The baby cried all that day. The pain and hunger would not go away. The father gone and not coming back. Mother and son live in a shack. No job, no money, or love to share. Asking on the streets for money to spare. She does drugs. With the money buys cocaine. Her whole wide world is a puddle of shame. She just left him there in the park leaving his world surrounded by dark. No sorrow or guilt at all that day, just turning her head and walking away. As he grew older and knew she was gone, he knew it was not he who went wrong. His new family washed away his pain. He no longer had to live with the blame of his mother who decided to give him away, the mother who left him in the park that day. I still, 25 years later, still get goosebumps when I read this poem and the emotion and pathos that it brings forth. This is, by the way, not uh, autobiographical. It was written to a picture. And you will notice that it uses very simple vocabulary because this is a kid who was coming back to school with a second grade reading level who had not had any success. It uses simple vocabulary and it uses a simple rhyme scheme, but her ability to voice emotion, to look at a picture and bring it alive in poetry and in stories was absolutely awesome. And that's why I classify this one as a stage four writing piece. Um, and that completes our journey of Stage three and stage four literacy in reading, spelling, and writing.